Hello coders! Today we will be talking about Chapter 10, Disease of the Respiratory System and IC10CM coding. This is J00 to J99. Now our guidelines here for a couple of specific types of conditions. We're going to have guidelines that are based off of COPD and asthma. We're going to have uh, ones based off of ventilator associated pneumonia. And we're going to have a, a couple of other little guidelines we're going to be looking at. So we're going to go through the guidelines and then we're going to go into the IC10 data and we're going to look at some of the coding. We're going to look at some of the notations and some of the other situations that might come about. So the first starts with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD and asthma. Okay, so COPD is one of these conditions that is kind of um, very strange because it's a combination of different diseases. And so what I'm going to do for you guys is I want to show you um, what we can use to understand a better way to look up COPD. Now some code books are going to automatically have um, you know the wording in there COPD and it's either going to tell you C, disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary, etc. However, there's an integral relationship between COPD chronic bronchitis and emphysema okay so we want to keep that in mind as we go forward in these guidelines so an acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive bronchitis and asthma in the codes and categories j44 and j45 distinguish between uncomplicated cases and those in acute exacerbation an acute exacerbation is uh, a worsening or decompensation of a chronic condition an acute exacerbation is not equivalent to an infection superimposed on a chronic condition, though an exacerbation may be triggered by an infection. So for instance, most common types of exacerbations that happen are due to a change in temperature. So in the winter time, someone going from a nice warm house out to snow. In the summertime, someone going from air conditioning into the hot weather. Okay, and so that's more of an exacerbation. We also uh, hear about this if, let's say, someone was running, they might have an exacerbation. Um, if they happen to have an infection, that can also give them an exacerbation. But an exacerbation is not the same thing as an infection, though an infection can cause an exacerbation. It doesn't go either way. It's only a one-way street for that. Now, for acute respiratory failure. A code from subcategory J96.0, acute respiratory failure, or subcategory J96.2, acute and chronic respiratory failure, may be assigned as a principal diagnosis when it is the condition established after study to be chiefly responsible for occasioning the admission to the hospital. And the selection is supported in the alphabetic index and tabular list. However, chapter-specific coding guidelines, such as obstetrics, poisonings, HIV, and newborn that provide sequencing direction take precedence. So that's the big thing to kind of keep in mind. The big thing to keep in mind here is that every situation is going to be a little different and we need to know if respiratory failure was the main reason, the main cause of being admitted to the hospital. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So we want to be clear with documentation. It can always be used as a secondary though. Respiratory failure may be listed as a secondary diagnosis if it occurs after admission or if it's present on admission but does not meet the definition of principal diagnosis. So for instance, if we know that the patient had a myocardial infarction which led them to cardiac failure, what comes after cardiac failure? Respiratory failure. So that's when we could use this as a secondary diagnosis. However, if they conclude that it was the acute respiratory failure or chronic respiratory failure that was the cause of the admission, then that code will go first. Okay? However, every situation is different. So when a patient is admitted with respiratory failure and another condition, like a myocardial infarction, cerebrovascular accident, or aspiration pneumonia. The principal diagnosis will not be the same in every situation. 
This applies whether the other acute condition is respiratory or, or non-respiratory condition. Selection of the principal diagnosis will be dependent on the circumstances of admission. If both the respiratory failure and the other acute conditions are equally responsible for occasioning the admission to the hospital, and there are no chapter-specific sequencing rules, the guideline regarding two or more diagnoses that equally meet the definition for principal diagnosis may be applied in these situations. So this is a guideline that tells us coder's choice. If we have two conditions that are at the exact same severity and have no specific guidelines or notations at their codes that tell you what gets coded first and what gets coded second, they can both be coded and it's up to the coder to decide which is going to be primary, which is going to be secondary. So that's where that coder's choice comes in. Again, if the documentation is not clear as to whether the acute respiratory failure and another condition are equally responsible for occasioning the admission, query the provider for clarification. Always go back to the provider for clarification of the information, okay, because we want to make sure that we understand what happened first, what happened second. Okay, let's talk about influenza. So, influenza, which is due to certain identified influenza viruses. We code only confirmed cases of influenza due to certain identified influenza viruses, which are in category J09, and due to other identified influenza viruses, category J10. This is an exception to the hospital inpatient guideline for uncertain diagnosis because very much like uh, HIV, in this context, confirmation does not require documentation of positive laboratory serology testing specific for avian or other novel influenza A and other identified influenza virus. However, coding should be based on the prior's diagnostic statement that a patient has avian influenza or another novel influenza A for category J09 or has another particular identified strain of influenza, such as H1N1, which is swine flu, or H3N2, but not identified as novel or variant for category J10, okay? So again, confirmation doesn't require us to have a piece of paper from a lab saying the patient has this in their system. Okay, and that's because these can take multiple hours, multiple days, and when people have these types of influenza and they're sick enough, we're not going to wait for them to find out. We're going to admit them and we're going to see what happens after that point. But again, the provider has to say, the patient has this, versus down here, if the provider records suspected or possible or probable avian influenza, novel influenza, or other identified influenza, then the appropriate influenza code from J11, influenza due to unidentified influenza virus, should be assigned. A code from category J09, influenza due to certain identified influenza viruses, should not be assigned nor should a code from category J10, influenza due to other identified influenza virus. So again, the provider has to give us that diagnostic statement. If that diagnostic statement involves any of the words suspected, possible, probable, or I'm thinking it's this, or anything that indicates unknown, we do not code the J09 or J10. We would code from category J11 due to the unidentified influenza virus, okay? So again, it's all about documentation. What do we know about the patient's condition? Okay, now let's talk a little bit about what we call VAP, ventilator-associated pneumonia. Okay, as with all procedural or post-procedural complications, Code assignment is based on the provider's documentation of the relationship between the condition and the procedure. So, code J95.851, ventilator-associated pneumonia, should be assigned only when the provider has documented ventilator-associated pneumonia. 
an additional code to identify the organism, such as Pseudomonas aeruginosa, code B96.5, should also be assigned. Do not assign additional codes from categories J12 to J18 to identify the type of pneumonia. Code J95.851 should not be assigned for cases where the patient has pneumonia and is on a medical ventilator and the provider has not specifically stated that pneumonia is ventilator associated pneumonia. If the documentation is unclear as to whether the patient has pneumonia that is a complication attributable to the mechanical ventilator, query the provider. So just as it sounds like, ventilator-associated pneumonia is when the patient ha is already on a ventilator and acquires pneumonia as a result of being on that ventilator, meaning the pneumonia virus got into the ventilator air and into their lungs, okay? Versus someone who just has pneumonia and then is put on a ventilator, okay? It's cause and effect. VAP means the patient was on a ventilator first and then got pneumonia, okay? <clears throat> now, a patient may be admitted with one type of pneumonia, like J13, pneumonia due to streptococcus pneumonia, and subsequently develops VAP. In this instance, the principal diagnosis would be the appropriate code from category J12 to J18 for the pneumonia diagnosed at the time of admission. Okay, so again, what was the patient admitted with? That will go first. If the patient acquired VAP on top of that, we code that as well. So code J95.851, ventilator-associated pneumonia, would be assigned as an additional diagnosis when the provider has also documented the presence of ventilator-associated pneumonia. Just like a patient can have two different types of pneumonia at the same time, this is the same thing, except for VAP means that the patient was on a ventilator and acquired pneumonia through the air in that ventilator. Okay, so we need to be careful with all of these codes. So let's look at the code category. So, disease of the respiratory system notates to us when a respiratory condition is described as occurring in more than one site, it is not specifically indexed, it should be classified to the lower anatomic site, okay? We use additional codes, um, in this case, for environmental tobacco smoke, exposure to tobacco smoke in the perinatal period, history of tobacco dependence that is far in the back, Occupational exposure to environmental tobacco smoke, current tobacco dependence, and tobacco use, meaning that someone uses it on occasion. It excludes a lot of the other conditions because, again, there are specific guidelines. So it excludes a lot of our P codes, most of our infectious diseases, a lot of the complications of pregnancy, and that's because all of these extra areas have their own sets of guidelines to deal with the, um, the respiratory uh, conditions or the combination of respiratory and, such as, you know, pregnancy complicated by pneumonia. We have a code for that. So we're going to see codes in the upper respiratory infections, okay? Now this is where the J95 to J97s become very, very important. So some of these codes will include the actual um, infectious agent, okay? So in this case, it tells us, use additional code B95 to B97 to identify infectious agent. So if someone is having any of these acute sinusitises, we have to code also the infectious agent, okay? So that is just one portion of this. A lot of the acute infections are going to send you back to the B95s to B97s to identify the specific infectious agents. However, we also have a lot of combination codes. So for instance, when we get to um, our other uh, respiratory disorders um, of the respiratory tract in the J30s, okay? Sometimes these are going to include them, sometimes they won't. 
So again, for this, this is chronic sinusitis. So again, where it is, because again, the acute sinusitis usually due to an infectious agent, the chronic, not so much. For our pneumonias, it's going to be a combination code. Pneumonia due to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. That is one code, not two codes. I also want to show you some of the information about COPD and asthma. So COPD is codes J44. Again, we have to identify if there's any history of exposure or use or dependence of tobacco. We code also any type of asthma if they have it. Again, here are a whole variety of different terms. So when I was saying earlier that COPD is a combination of COPD, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema, this is where you're going to see it. Chronic emphysema with emphysema, sorry, chronic bronchitis with emphysema is the same thing as COPD, okay? But this is what we need to know, and this is where a lot of people get confused. J44.0 means that they have COPD and they currently have an acute lower respiratory infection, lower respiratory, okay? So we have to be careful about this. This would be like pneumonia. Okay, a lot of people get the upper respiratory infections, so we need to be careful about whether it describes upper or lower respiratory. All right, J44.1 is with an acute exacerbation, so that means the patient is having problems breathing right now because of an exacerbation of their COPD. Again, it could be something activity related, it could be weather related, uh, a whole variety of scenarios of triggers for people with COPD. However, if the patient just has COPD, we're going to code to J44.9 if nothing else is going on in relation to a lower respiratory infection or an acute exacerbation, okay? So this is a code that a lot of people get confused with because this is all it is for COPD. Asthma goes a little bit more intense. So asthma, again, we still use additional codes for all the different uh, tobacco and environmental smoke. Again, lots of different includes terms, all the different types of asthma. And as we go down after the explanation of what happens, what type of asthma, okay? Is it mild intermittent? Is it mild persistent, moderate persistent, severe persistent, or other and unspecified, okay? And you can also see we have uncomplicated, meaning right now everything's fine with an acute exacerbation, meaning they're having trouble breathing right now because of something that just came on. And then we have something called status asthmaticus. Status asthmaticus is a condition where the patient's breathing is not getting better even with treatment. So for instance, if you have a, uh, a teenager who has asthma and they play a sport, if let's say during that sport, they start having an acute exacerbation, they go to the sidelines, they sit down. They take their inhalers, a couple minutes later, they're not feeling any better. They're not breathing any better. You know, at that point, that's where the worry starts and that this might be turning into status asthmaticus. And status asthmaticus usually will require a trip to the hospital uh, because there's different types of uh, injections, IVs, and other types of breathing treatments that are a lot easier to get into the body uh, that a patient won't just have on themselves. So, you know, this teenager might have a rescue inhaler, but if the rescue inhaler is not working, then we have to start thinking about, okay, other medical intervention. And so status asthmaticus is a very specific condition, and you should usually, usually only see it if a patient goes to the office and gets sent to the emergency department. Um, if they're in the emergency department, um, they could also, of course, be an observation in the emergency department or if they're admitted. We're not usually going to see this in many other areas because, again, if they're not getting any better, they will end up at the hospital to get proper treatment to see how they can properly treat whatever's going on with the status asthmaticus. So the big thing here is make sure that you're being as specific as possible. What is the type of influenza? Okay, what is the type of asthma? What, you know, what is the infectious agent? Is it included in my J code? Or do I have to look for a notation to go find a code from J95 to J97? So I want you to keep that all in mind as you continue coding. Have a great day.